Welcome to this webinar on Plan S, which is something I think many people have heard of, but not a lot of people really understand. The implementation of the plan is going to have a huge impact on the future of open access publishing over the next few years, and obviously by extension impact on those who work with researchers, or indeed are researchers themselves. So there are four key topics to cover in this webinar, which is going to help you get to grips with the basics of Plan S. We're going to explore what Plan, Plan S actually is and why it's important, how it aims to improve the future of open access publication and some of the problems it's going to solve. Obviously, on the flip side of that, some of the concerns that have already been raised and how the plan could be implemented by various institutions. So first of all, it's important to know what Plan S actually is, and it was something that was launched in September 2018, and it's an initiative of a group known as Coalition S. And if you're Googling that, it's Coalition lowercase, but with a um, uppercase O and A in the middle. This is a consortia of European research funders and includes some big names such as UK Research and Innovation, the European Research Council and several national funders. And they've all come together under the coordination of a group called Science Europe. So combined, they have a research budget annually of approximately £15 billion, which is not an insignificant sum of money and will come into play further on. The aim of Plan S is quite clear and you can see it on the screen here. It aims to make the results of research that's funded by the participating groups publicly accessible upon publication. This is something open access advocates have been calling for for quite a long time now. And although more research is being made available, the system as a whole has been quite slow to change the publication system. So Plan S seeks to uh, take things kind of a step further by providing steps that researchers and publishers can take and it's giving a clear deadline of actually January the 1st, 2020. At this point, I think it's important to note that you'll see on the screen that the wording of the AIM actually says, refers to scientific publications. But the uh, group have actually confirmed that this encompasses all research publications. It's just that they think of all research as rigorous and objective in scope, and so they're terming everything scientific, which probably cause more problems than it will solve. But it does include everything. Important to stress to any panicked researchers, I think. So as well as the overall aim, the plan is made up of these 10 key principles that you see on the screen. And the first thing I think is important to stress is that despite its name, Plan S is not actually a policy itself. It's a statement of principles, which those involved in scholarly publishing can and should adopt. Exactly how these principles translate into policy is going to be up to both the individual research funders, publishers and institutions. And we'll talk more about implementation further on in the webinar. Most of the principles in the plan are not actually that new. If you uh, have a read through them, you'll probably recognise some of the terms that are on the screen there. They just kind of formalise some aspects of open access, which have been around for quite a long time. Most funders already have guidelines in place about open access and what they are and are not prepared to pay for. And most open access fees are covered as part of a funding application or from a central university fund. And although it's not unheard of, it's actually quite rare to find researchers paying open access fees out of their own pocket. The last few years have also seen a rise in sort of audits and sanctions for non-compliance as we've moved beyond the introduction of the open access message. Most researchers sort of know what it is now become more well known and funders have actually moved on to the, the monitoring compliance stage as they want to protect their investment, which is fair enough. And essentially, although these principles, they don't really contribute anything new, it's just what we've always been doing. I think it's quite good to have them clearly written down here as a document that we can refer back to as part of kind of a formal plan. There are also aspects of the plan which are going to be really helpful to those who are actually working day to day to administer open access in their institution. So you'll see on the screen here references to standardization and capping of open access fees, which will hopefully make the whole process less complicated, both for researchers and librarians, as well as um, the fact that organizations should be working to align their policies so it's not different between each one. Researchers are obviously quite mobile, it's likely they're going to be moving around during their careers, they might not always stay at one institution. It would be helpful if there was some crossover between uh, institutional policies. Usually, 
it's a bit too confusing it just ends up confusing people more so I think anything that offers any type of clarification is going to be a positive so that's the good news obviously some of the principles have proved slightly more controversial and we'll talk about that in more detail further on but the four principles highlighted on the screen have already sort of caused a few grumbles from those who are involved in the sector you'll see at the top left there that uh, there's a uh, principle that authors retain a copyright in their publication with no restriction and also it does recommend that a CC BY license, a Creative Commons license be attached to it. So people are concerned that the licenses that are going to be attached to their material is going to cause a bit too much freedom and they're slightly worried that they have a, a loss of what's known as academic freedom because it states that hybrid open access journals will no longer be compliant. And there's also an implication there that funders might have, be having to create new platforms which will conform to Plan S. We'll talk about this in a bit more detail in the next couple of slides, but researchers are a little bit worried about the impact that's going to have on their work and the choices they can make about where they share it. From a sort of library point of view, the, the probably the biggest problem is going to be, you'll see the date there, January the 1st, 2020. As I sit here now recording this webinar, it's March 2019, and it's actually not that far away, the 1st of January 2020, so it's, it's going to be a lot of work to do. And even though um, the plan does acknowledge that working out open access monographs, open access books is going to take longer than that, it's not leaving much time for the rest of the process, and we're not talking about an insignificant amount of work here. Currently at the time of recording there are 13 institutions and funders signed up to Plan S and these include some big names such as Spark Europe, Open Air, the Swiss National Science Foundation and LIBOR as well. So let's take another look, a sort of deeper look at the more positive impact of the plan and some of the problems it's hoping to address. Plan S can really help, I think, to advance research. So although the sort of concept of open access to research publications has been discussed for more than a decade now, the actual progress towards wider adoption has been quite slow and there's been lots of frustration along the way. Those involved in putting together the plan argue that the whole point of research is to use previous work to create new knowledge and that we can't really do that if the research is kept behind a paywall, which is obviously a fairly standard argument in favour of open access in general. Plan S aims to help advance the goal of making research openly available by forcing, it's maybe too strong a word, but forcing those involved in publishing research to take some type of action. It's saying, we're serious about this, you need to do something. Also, it can hopefully bring those involved in securing open access to work more in line with each other. So there's been a sort of an increased appetite for change from lots of different institutions recently but it seems like they're all sort of working in their own little silos when they really would have more power working together towards the same goal. So hopefully what Plan S can do is help them unite behind something, behind the principles, and combine their power to be a force for real change. The funders themselves are also realising that they've got a great deal of financial power, and that's quite a strong incentive when it comes to negotiations. So if you remember these funders that are already involved have access to about £15 billion annually of research funding, which I'd like to think gives them some leverage. Linked to this is the desire to actually change the system. So the traditional model of, of paying fees and subscriptions is sort of be justified when most of the research outputs were printed in a physical journal, and that needed a lot of, sort of time, effort and work to produce, but you can kind of argue that times have moved on, things have changed. Open access makes sharing research easier than before, essentially for less money. So why are we still spending money on a second system that does exactly the same thing? If you've got an open access system which can do it cheaply, can do it economically, why are we spending all this money on traditional publication? You may argue that might have something to do with publishers' profits. Plan S is aiming to avoid pushing for any one open access solution over the other. It just it wants open access as the end result and wants to encourage some innovation about creating an open system that works for everyone, which is something that the sort of traditional open access movement, if you want to call it that, doesn't really seem to have achieved. Finally, Plan S can really help the move towards open and responsible research. So 
it actually encourages sharing not just the final paper and the books and the outputs, but also the sort of data that underpins that and any preprints that come out. So essentially anything that comes out of the research process that can be used to help advance knowledge and create more for other people to build on, which really fits in with the whole open research agenda. Plan S also supports DORA, which is the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment. And that advocates that research is assessed on its own merits, not on the merits of the journal it's published in or the out outlet it's published in. A move from this group of research funders supporting openness, I think, really helps to send a strong message to the wider community about the importance of responsible research, which can only be a good thing. Obviously, on the flip side of that, there have been some concerns around Planis, and although it's still relatively new, there has already been an open letter of protest over the plan, which has been signed to date by more than 600 researchers. But what is it they're actually objecting to? To answer this question properly, we need to think back to the 10 principles that we looked at earlier, and I'm just going to pick a few out for you. So perhaps the most pressing concern is the sort of perceived impact that Plan S is going to have on a researcher's choice to publish in the title which is the best fit for their work. So this choice has long been an integral part of academic freedom and people are concerned that by making open access, hybrid open access titles non-compliant, they're going to take a bit of that freedom away and they're concerned um, what effect that's going to have on them. So just as a reminder, hybrid journals are those which publish most of their content actually behind a paywall under a traditional subscription model but they'll make selected articles available open access for a fee this article processing charge as it's known can run into many thousands of pounds i think the average is about 1700 but that's the average across all of the the journals and institutions will then as well as paying that open access fee, they're still going to have to pay a subscription to access all the rest of the content in the journal that's not openly available. What researchers are worried about is that the restriction on publishing in hybrid titles, together with sort of the encouragement that the principals have that if appropriate um, platforms, open access platforms don't and titles don't already exist, in Plan S's words, they're going to um, provide some incentives for the creation of these. Researchers are worried that all this is leading to sort of forcing them to publish in certain titles which the plan deems compliant, and that these titles might not have the same level of prestige as others, and that this might have an impact on their career, because like it or not, researchers are judged on the quality of the, the perceived quality of the journals which they publish in. However, I think it's important to reassure them that this move towards hybrid non-compliance is not really a new thing. Lots of institutions have stopped paying open access fees for hybrid journals in recent times. Either whether that's for budgetary reasons or moral reasons, it's quite a common condition now. However, we still do need to acknowledge that it could be a potential problem for researchers. We're here to support the research community. It's a valid concern that they have. Researchers are still going to be able to publish in uh, hybrid journals, at least during kind of transition period whilst uh, Plan S comes in, which could be anything from two to three years. As long as the journal has either some type of offsetting agreement with the institution or something that's known as a transformative agreement. So a transformative agreement is when a publisher of a particular uh, closed access title publicly commits to saying that, okay, I'm going to make this title completely open access after a certain period on a certain date, and that will be monitored. So they're going to have to sort of publicly declare their intentions and then actually follow it through. And funders are going to carefully monitor that to ensure that they're... So it remains to be seen exactly uh, what type of impact all these agreements will have, but researchers should, I think, really be quite reassured that they'll still have plenty of choice about where they can publish their work. If you think about the current green open access route, that allows authors to publish anywhere they like as long as they deposit a copy of their accepted manuscript in a repository. Accepted manuscript being the um, sort of final peer reviewed copy that the journal has agreed to publish. Although Plan S takes this a step further because it, it says it should be published with a zero month embargo, so it should be available openly in the repository at the same time that it's published in the journal. It's not 
that radically different from what's happening now. It's just tagging an extra step onto the end. In the meantime, this all feeds into, I think, what's a bigger argument about the nature of the academic reward system and how researchers are rewarded not only for their research or not at all for their actual research, but for where it's published. So if you can get your journal into your journal article into a high impact journal like Nature, it's automatically better than if it's in a low impact journal. But that's not necessarily true if you look at the actual quality of the research. This all links to the responsible research movement that we talked about earlier. Another concern researchers have is that by signing up to Plan S, it's going to make it hard for them to get collaboration, especially within Europe and those outside Europe. And of course, at the time of recording, this adds to uh, certain other large Europe related events that might make it slightly uncomfortable for researchers, but we'll have to see how that pans out. This is, I think, going to be especially true for researchers who want to publish in titles which are not Europe based, which wouldn't be seen as compliant under Plan S, and this might then impact their choice of who to work with. So it's a legitimate concern. At the moment, I don't have any easy answers for that one. I think it's one of those kind of wait and see situations. And as I said, with the whole Brexit thing, we're not entirely sure at the time of recording what is happening there or even if it's going to happen and what impact that is going to have on collaboration as a whole. The hope is that it won't have a negative impact because uh, globally publishers are hopefully moving more towards open access. But realistically, we're some way off total open access. So that might be a bit of a wait and see one, unfortunately. Predatory publishers could also be a problem. So these are publishers who charge authors a high fee to publish their work, but they don't provide any of the review or editing services that that fee would normally cover. So these publishers will essentially publish absolutely anything as long as they're paid, even if it's completely made up. And there are some quite humorous examples if you Google them that you can find online. The danger for researchers here is that as well as losing money, they might find that their perfectly legitimate research is sitting alongside what is pure rubbish and publishing with these titles is absolutely nothing for their academic reputation. So there are concerns that these type of publishers will be looking to take advantage of the sort of potential confusion around Plan S and what the rules are and how researchers can apply and that sort of thing and to try and get researchers to publish in slightly dodgy titles. This might well happen. And I think researchers and the library staff who support them need to be prepared to educate themselves on what a quality publication looks like. So how do you know that the, the title is not predatory in some way. Luckily, there's lots of tools that are available to help people do this. I think the um, best one is the Think, Check, Submit website, which if you Google will come up. And that guides researchers through a checklist of what to look for in terms of a predatory publisher. Or, you know, how do you know that this is a legitimate title if you've not heard of it? I think the basic rule is that if something seems too good to be true, then it probably is. You probably know in your gut something's wrong. And that any potential offer to publish, whilst it might be flattering, should be really scrutinised to make sure it's legitimate before you sign on the dotted line. There are also some concerns around copyright, which is everyone's favourite topic, and attaching open licences to work. So this is often a concern that's raised by researchers who are worried that their work might be stolen or misinterpreted in some way. A major principle of Plan S is that instead of transferring the copyright in the work, the final finished work on publication to the publisher, that the researcher instead retains it and adds an open license, which will enable a publisher to sort of have first rights to publish it. Under this system, researchers who publish their work, or under the current system, if you've published something with a publisher, you probably sign the copyright over to them. And if the researcher then wants to reuse it in any other work or they're teaching, they're going to need to seek permission as they would with any other third party copyright item. A lot of people don't understand this. They think because they wrote it, therefore they own a copyright. They don't realize they've signed it away. And that leads to a lot of unintentional infringement and um, accidental self plagiarism. And it's also kind of at odds with the whole principle that making research outputs as accessible and reusable as possible. So adding an open license is also 
bit of a problem for some disciplines, especially those in the arts and humanities. The CC by Creative Commons um, Attribution Licence, which is the most permissive of the Creative Commons open licences, essentially allows anyone to use, adapt or otherwise repurpose the work as long as they credit the author of the original. So you could come along and use this webinar, which is licensed CC by, essentially do what you want with it, including make money out of it, as long as you said that I was the one that came up with it. It's not really so much of a problem in, as a, of an issue in the science disciplines where answers are sort of very black and white. You, you do an experiment and this is the result of it. But in disciplines where the conclusions are more based on individual interpretations of documents or circumstances, so that the historical and arts disciplines and to some extent the social sciences as well, it's more of a concern and researchers are essentially worried that words are going to be put into their mouths and that their arguments will be warped in some way. One solution to this would be um, to add a clause to the license, the uh, Creative Commons license, which specified that no derivatives could be taken of the work, but this would conflict with the CC BY license as mandated by Plan H. So this whole move towards open licenses is something that's been coming for a long time, and it's, it's one of those things that's not new to Plan S, it's just one of those things that's been more formalised. The UK scholarly communication license is, an, is another sort of movement and that also includes retention of copyright as a fundamental principle. And we have statements um, such as the University of California's Declaration of Rights and Principles to Transform Scholarly Communication, which is a very snappy title, and that essentially says the same sort of thing. So whilst there is a concern that permissive licenses you might be a bit of a problem, that's understandable, researchers should remember that there are some fail-safes built into Creative Commons licences and that these are legally binding licences. People tend to think that because you can get the licence off the internet, they're not legally binding, but I promise they are. Under um, any type of Creative Commons licence, authors can choose to have their name removed completely from work and they need to remember that the inclusion of a CC BY licence, there's a, actually a clause in the licence that says that any work having that license does not in any way imply endorsement of any subsequent adaptation, which is something that a lot of people are worried about with these licenses. Obviously, there's still some way to go to convince everyone of the benefits of this, but if in terms of ensuring that research is shared and built upon, the benefits of it really far outweigh the perceived problems. Authors will be able to publish their work while still retaining the freedom to use it in future works, Others can take it and build on it and help further knowledge, which is hopefully the reason that most researchers got involved in research in the first place. The final major concern is the potential impact of the plan on the global south. So really thinking here areas such as Africa, Latin America and certain parts of Asia, which have in the past been classed as kind of developing economies. These countries have booming research sectors and they do a lot of valuable work but they often operate in financially constrained circumstances. On the face of it, Plan S is a really good thing for them, it's, it's going to help open up access to more materials without them having to pay expensive subscriptions. But on the flip side, their concerns that Plan is going to lead to what's known as a pay to publish system, where the article processing charges replace subscription charges and that kind of puts, transfers the financial burden from the, the reader to the author of the work. So the author is going to have to pay to publish, so the reader doesn't have to pay to read it. This means that those in the Global South, they might actually find themselves in a situation where they, they can read more content, which is good, in world-leading journals, but they actually can't afford to publish their own work in these titles. So really, are they any further forward? Supporters of Plan S argue that for many, the sort of access benefits outweigh issues about publication. But Coalition S have actually made it clear that they don't want anyone to be unable to publish because they don't have funds. It's less clear how they actually intend to do this, but most people have assumed there's going to be some sort of waiver system introduced. And remember, the plan is still quite new, so things are still developing. There have also been deals done in European countries to create something known as publish and read agreements. 
So under these institutions or consortia pay an upfront fee to publishers and that covers the cost of making all of the research outputs of that institution openly available with the aim that eventually it will catch on and everything will be available openly. Of course, uh, people always criticise these plans as well, saying that for the most part they're closed, so no one quite knows what everyone else's deal is and whether they're getting ripped off. They don't know what the specifics are and they can't tell if they're getting a good deal. And other people say that these deals are still giving preference to sort of larger institutions who can afford them, which obviously doesn't include those in the global south. This is another thing that we might have to wait and see. And while people sort of figure out how Plan S, which is Europe centric, can be adapted to different systems outside Europe. Of course, the million dollar question is exactly how is Plan S going to be implemented? The final response is currently being finalised as a sort of open call for feedback from the wider open access community after the launch of the plan. But realistically, that 1st of January 2020 deadline is not that far away and people do need to start making some plans. As of recording this webinar, there are sort of three main suggested options for implementation. Option one is really the ideal option for many Plan S supporters. And outputs will be open access from publication with no waiting period, something sometimes known as born open access content. This should be done via journals and other platforms which only publish materials open access and all outputs should have a CC BY license which is the most open of the Creative Commons licenses. This option obviously makes things immediately accessible but usually comes with some type of cost which not everyone can afford and as discussed there have been problems attached to CC BY licenses by some. Option 2 is another option that people are probably quite familiar with as it's like the green open access model that we see today. Under this option the version of records, so the final published version, or the author's accepted manuscript, which is the final draft which has been approved by the publisher for publication, should be made available via a compliant repository under a CC BY license. The major issue with this option is the compliant repository. So guidance will be released about what makes a platform compliant and funders can offer incentives to create new ones, but as we talked about earlier, some people are concerned that this might restrict a choice when it comes to uh, sharing their outputs. Option three is kind of a stopgap measure which allows outputs to be published in hybrid journals where they have the uh, transformative agreement and that's the time bound commitment to transition to full open access which is why temporarily it's sort of there in bold. This is being definitely offered only as a temporary measure and option one and two are definitely the preferred choices. What's important to remember is that Plan S is not a policy, it's a set of principles which funders are adopting. Although implementation is scheduled for 2020, realistically the degree to which this is going to happen is going to vary. Funders have actually said that timescales are different for everyone and although they might, and some might start enforcing things straight away, so from now onwards, since the plan has been launched, some might start um, exactly on the 1st of January. Some may only actually apply the principles to grants that are awarded after the 1st of January, so current research projects may not be um, caught up in all this and may not be involved. There might be some kind of wiggle room. Individual institutions can sign up to support Plan S by issuing a supporting statement and at the time of recording 25 have done this. So what's next for Plan S? The consultation on feedback is now closed, so that's been collated and no doubt there will be some kind of changes and adapt adaptations as a result. There will also be a transition period when it's officially launched in 2020 and there will be a lot of people keeping close eye on the progress of that one. A formal review of the plan is scheduled for 2023, so three years after initial launch, and that aims to both assess the progress and the impact so far. And I think a lot of this is going to focus on how the transformative agreements are impacting people and whether they are actually working as they're only ever intended to be a temporary measure. 
I think the most important thing library staff can do about Plan S is to try and keep up to date with what's happening and try to provide information to their research community because it's yet another term that's being thrown around and people don't always understand it. A lot of scare stories out there about the plan and its sort of potential impact, but hopefully this webinar has offered some more balanced argument which you can pass on to researchers who have any questions. Thanks for watching.